Cross, your whole attitude is really positive. Well, you know, it's a long season, Ralph, and uh, you can't go by each and every ball game. Obviously, I would have loved to see them <laughs> score a couple of runs that last inning. But uh, we're playing pretty good ball. I mean, we're getting some uh, excellent pitching. Um, the hitting isn't as timely at the moment, but I think all our kids are trying real hard, and we hope for better things. Well, one of the things I'm sure people would like to know would be your opinion of what the new operation is going to do in the way of getting better ball players. Uh, you did get the ball club too late when you purchased the team to get in the free agent market, and you can't get in that until after the end of the season. But uh, do you have optimistic ideas in regard to other players and new players? We sure do. Our, our goal, obviously, is to have a contender. And when we bought the club, we said that we would do everything that is necessary. Uh, the first two steps were to sign uh, Craig Swan and uh, Joel Youngblood, which we've accomplished. Now I think it's a matter of uh, what becomes available. Uh, a lot of people ask us, uh, are we going to be in the free agent draft? Are we going to trade? And what are we going to do? And of course, Frank Cashin is the baseball man as the executive vice president of this club and will run the baseball operations. But I think in, uh, in my communications with Frank, it's, it's, uh, it's sparse at the moment in terms of uh, what's being made available to us. But when it becomes available, I can tell you we'll be right there. Well, that's really the good news that all of us have heard, and we certainly are looking forward to that. One of the things that uh, you hear fans talking about is, why don't they trade? And uh, the, the thing I think that not too many people realize, or maybe they do realize it, is that when you trade to get a good ball player, you have to give up a good ball player to get them. I mean, there are just not trades available that you're going to go out and say, I'm going to get Dave Winfield, or I'm going to get Dave Parker, or I'm going to get so-and-so. Because to get those players, you have to give up some. I'm glad you said that anyway, Frank, because I might be uh, something, something called tampering. In any event, though, I, I do believe that uh, it, you have to give up good ball players, obviously, to get good ball players. Not many clubs are trading for cash and just dollars. Um, nevertheless, I think there will be ball players available. What we won't want to do, and what Frank has said that uh, it's not worthwhile for us to do, is to, uh, is to uh, get into a situation where we trade away great ball players who maybe have not come into their own yet and therefore we'd be trading away our future. We don't want to do that. Of course, Frank Cashin, the new general manager of the Mets, is he took over late and he's got to get everything in, or in order, an organization going that uh, will benefit the ball club. And I think the other thing that you have to do, and uh, he certainly is doing it, is to find out just how good your talent is and get opinions from everyone that you can. And he does that. He sure does. He is a very industrious guy. He's out here early, as you know, and he's here late. And uh, he's assessing his talent. Uh, our position is, and that's true of the front office as well as on the field, uh, we just don't believe you go in there and you just fire a lot of people. I mean, uh, one doesn't know what one gets when one mm -hmm. fires people that he has. You have to assess your talent both on the field and off the field and uh, then go from there. One of the things that's noticeable if you come to the ballpark is that there are new seats being put in all around the place. It's been cleaned up. It's been put in working order. The New clubhouses have been finished. Uh, the new press room has been really brought up to date, back to where it was, and I think that's all a positive step because as an ex-baseball player, I know you have to have pleasant surroundings to get a pleasant feeling, and that's been done. I think that's, uh, I think that's true, and we're proud of that, Ralph. We didn't have much time to do it, but we are proud. We still have more things to do, but the attitude that uh, the ownership has is that our kids should know that they're with a first-class organization. We may not be in first place at the moment, but they're with a first-class organization, and they won't be treated any better or worse whether they're in first or, or last, as the case may be now. But as long as they're in there hustling and trying, that's all we can ask. We can only be supportive of the players off the field to do everything to make it uh, attractive for them to want to be here and to play better baseball. The same thing is true with the fans wherein we can't really go out there and pitch and hit. What we can do with the fans is we could make Shea Stadium a more attractive place. Jim Nagurney, our vice president of uh, business, has certainly uh, uh, done that to the best extent he can with the little time he had. And uh, I think that that's our goal, to make it fun to come out to Shea Stadium, to make it a fun day. And other than the loss uh, in the first game, I tell you, it's fun to sit out at this ballpark in this kind of weather uh, with about 25,000 people in the stands. Well, they're a good crowd out here today, and it's a perfect day for baseball. The first game of the doubleheader has been played. San Diego Padres won it, and then the second game will be going at it one more time. 
Fred Wilpon is our guest on the show, and Fred comes from an area close by, Brooklyn, New York. And Fred, I think one of the interesting stories about you is that you played on the same baseball team that Sandy Koufax played on, and you were the pitcher, and he was the first baseman. Who was the coach? <laughs> <laughs> coach is a fine guy by the name of Charlie Sheeran, whom, uh, if he happens to be listening, I would love to see. I haven't been able to get in touch with Charlie Sheeran. Uh, Sandy was a great basketball player, and uh, Sandy and I were not only teammates, but we were really good friends in high school. And so Sandy played uh, baseball because I played basketball. I played uh, basketball as well as Sandy played baseball on first base at the time. Mm -hmm. It was discovered only after high school that he had uh, a great arm. Uh, recently, as you know, in Vero Beach, I saw Sandy, and then he came back to see me in my place in Florida, and uh, we just had a marvelous two days together. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever run into, and he's got the biggest pair of hands I think I've ever seen outside of maybe somebody that's seven foot tall. He is, uh, he's a lot more slender now than he was. He, is, he, he is. weighed about uh, 220, I guess, when he was playing, to somewhere between 210 and 220. He's probably down to 185. Uh, the story about Sandy's hands, though, is that when I was pitching batting practice for the New York, for the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, I was trying to say the New York Mets, the Brooklyn Dodgers back in the uh, mid-50s, Sandy would come to the game and uh, as my guest and watch the game uh, and watch the batting practice and one day I asked him to compare hands with Gil Hodges. Uh, Mr. Hodges had big ones, uh, very very large hands and Sandy's hands actually were more slender but they actually were larger. Yeah I know, I know the size of them because I have big hands myself and one day on the show here after he'd won a ball game I compared mine to his and his fingers were about I'd say another inch longer than mine. He's, uh, uh, he's a marvelous uh, guy, Sandy, uh, as you did say. Uh, the great thing about uh, seeing him again was not that we sat down and talked about uh, necessarily the old guys in the old neighborhood, which we did to some extent, but it was, a, it was the kind of thing where, you know, you meet an old friend you haven't seen for a long time as if you haven't seen him only for a week, mm -hmm. and it was years. And we just sat there, we had a good time, and my wife and his wife, Ann, uh, got along real well, and we're looking forward to getting out to L.A. to, to see them again. Now, if you could just talk him into making a comeback, <laughs> playing for the New York Mets, you'd be in good shape. You know, he still is in great shape, as you say. He does a lot of jogging. You keep yourself in good shape, and you play tennis. I do. I love the game, and uh, uh, I'm not sure I love it as much as uh, uh, what happened this morning. I lost two out of three sets this morning uh, to some... Uh, <laughs> this hadn't been a good day for you. This was not a good day. I lost two out of three to uh, one of our local young pros who, uh, who was a good, very good player. Incidentally, there is a big tennis tournament coming up at Forest Hills, and it starts on May the 5th, I believe, isn't it? May 5th to That's the correct. 11th. It's the Tournament of Champions, and there'll be some great players playing in that tournament, and you can get your tickets right here at Shea Stadium. They're handling the tickets for the Tournament of Champions at Forest Hills. And you can also get them through Charge, Charge It or Ticketon. So if you'd like to go out there, there'll be some great tennis. John McEnroe will be one of the players. Jimmy Connors, two pretty good athletes right there. Carolitis, a uh, uh, number of uh, great players. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, spending some time out there. I've gone to that tournament uh, that Mr. Hunt uh, has put on since the beginning. That's, uh, I think this is the third year. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year he's got a new format, which seems to be a very exciting format. It's a, I think it's a half a million dollar that's an exciting thing. They get more money in this tournament than any tournament that in tennis. I think it's also <laughs> fun playing at uh, the West Side Tennis Club. It's Boy, just the history a marvelous there. place. The history there is so fabulous. When you think back that Bill Tillman played there and Ellie Vines and Don Budge and all those great old tennis players. Uh, in fact, uh, I've seen a lot of matches out there. It's great now to think that uh, here we are in New York, uh, I think the greatest city in the world. And uh, we're fortunate to have two great tennis facilities. We have West Side and we have the new U.S. Open facility here in Flushing Meadows. Right next and door. And both are really fantastic. I mean, it's just marvelous to watch tennis in either one of those places. Well, it's an exciting game, and uh, it'll be going on from May 5th through the 11th at uh, Forest Hills, and uh, really some great tennis will be played there. Getting back to uh, baseball, we'll do that in just a moment right after this message. I'm Ralph Kiner, and I'm talking with Fred Wilpon, who is the president of the New York Mets. And Fred, I think an interesting story would be to 
tell us how you put this whole thing together. How did the new Mets become? They were purchased for $21 million plus dollars. Somebody had to put it together. We'll have to have more than five minutes, Ralph. <laughs> it, takes, it takes that long. <laughs> well, I have, uh, I've always been interested in baseball, as you know. Um, played a little amateur baseball, and when I heard that the club would be available, I tried to seek uh, out the purchase of it. And uh, it was a long and, uh, and hard uh, acquisition because uh, up until the very end, we, we stayed very much in the background of the, of the publicity. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people who were out there saying that they had it and, uh, and they had it all locked up and all. And it wasn't until the next to last day that we got any publicity whatsoever on uh, our group. You did that, that was on purpose? That was on purpose, mm -hmm. yes. We didn't think that the publicity would help us get the team. And uh, I have uh, the good fortune of having uh, two wonderful partners, uh, the Doubleday and Company uh, are the major shareholders, and uh, City Investing Company, which is a large uh, company in New York City. So when you put it all together and put up the 21 million plus dollars, was there any thought to the fact you'd have to spend more millions to develop the ball club? Yes, there was. As a matter of fact, uh, the way we pre presented the whole purchase was that part of the purchase was the additional dollars that would have to be put up in the next four or five years. We knew that you just don't do this thing overnight and uh, we needed a, a considerable amount more money and we've capitalized the company with that much money. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we're prepared to spend uh, what is it, whatever is necessary to bring a contender to New York. Well, the Mets lost the first game of this doubleheader. They're playing the second game very shortly. And I guess even though it was a loss and the Mets have had some tough losses, uh, when you are sitting in the stands as the owner of the ball club, it's got to get to you. But at the same time, you've got to be very happy to be owning a part of a ball club in your, actually your hometown. That's got to be a tremendous thrill. Well, that is exciting. I think that maybe one of the things that has helped me is, is having played enough baseball from the time I was about seven till through college. It's helped me know that, you know, you can't win every day and, and you have your ups and downs and I perhaps have a little bit of a uh, closeness and or feeling toward the players and what happens on a daily basis, uh, perhaps a little better than if I had not had that experience. You know what amazes me, and I've had a chance to talk to Nelson Doubleday and others in the uh, operation of Doubleday, uh, John Sargent, who was out here today, mm -hmm. and uh, Jim uh, McGrath. And they really know the game of baseball. I mean, they start talking. They bring up names like Eddie Mixis and Tom Brown that you wouldn't know unless you've been following baseball a long time. It's easy to remember the Ted Williams, but they know them all. And the Ralph Kiners. Well, I hope they know me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as the great baseball player, Hall of Famer. No, they do know baseball. Uh, but interestingly enough, although all of us do know baseball as fans, uh, we also know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the professional side of baseball, and therefore we have stayed away from uh, giving our opinions to our professionals. Um, it's true, I talk to Frank Cashin uh, daily and see him most every day, and uh, he chooses to rap with me, so to speak, on, on different matters. But uh, if the buck had to be uh, passed, or if the decision had to be made, it would be Frank's decision as to whether a player uh, went or stayed, and Joe Torrey and Frank's decision as to who plays and what happens. I think you really got a good man in Frank Cashin because he's very patient, doesn't say much, but he thinks a lot. He spends an awful lot of time out here, and I think a general manager of a ball club has to really do a good job by spending maybe 16, 17 hours a day at it. It's a tremendously difficult job, and especially so nowadays. I think that's true. I think Gene, his wife, has uh, sees him less during the season than, uh, than everybody around here at Shea. I think we've got a wonderful nucleus of, uh, of professional baseball people. Joe Torrey is an excellent guy, uh, and uh, Frank Cashin, as you said, is, is, is just a, he's a winner. Uh, and I think together they're going to bring a contender and a winner to New York. Uh, we have also attempted to uh, put our first-rate uh, first, uh, uh, first -rate staff off the field. And we've been very happy in having uh, uh, men like Joe Donahue and Jay Horowitz and uh, people like that that have joined this organization of recent date. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like everything is going to be clean and neat and nice here at Shea Stadium. And the next thing will be a winning ball club. Do you have a timetable at all? Usually they have a plan of some kind, like Ranch Ricky came to Pittsburgh and he had a five-year plan. Uh, I hear the Russians have five-year plans <laughs> that they keep ripping up. So I don't have any five-year plan. Uh, but uh, the sooner the better. Um, I think the fans deserve it, and I think the fans, uh, the feeling I get around New York is, is one of excitement, one of uh, 
hey, we really want you to do well, and, and, and we hope you really can. And uh, the magic is back is not the magic of a, uh, of a winning team yet. That wasn't the, uh, that wasn't the, the reason. Point. That wasn't the point. The magic is back is a, a magic of baseball. A beautiful day. It's 75 degrees out here at Shea Stadium. What nicer place could one be at than to, to watch a doubleheader? Well, that's the way it is. A beautiful day here at Shea. We hope you stay with us. With us. We've been talking to Fred, Fred Wilpon, the president of the new New York Mets. So right now, let's go back.